Welcome everyone to part two of our webinar, Core Vitality and Resilient Wellbeing. And in this part, we're gonna focus on the 10 essential qualities that we had mentioned in the previous webinar. Um, so we were talking about circulating vital energy or an essential quality through our system. It will reinforce the well-being. It will invigorate us. But we need to really define what is an essential quality. I know we were defining it previously, so we're just going to briefly recap that here. An essential quality is a pure state of being before action. It is not active. If I can create Okay, the essential quality is creativity. I am a creator. I have the act of creating, but before I create, I am a creator. That's a simple example of what an essential quality would be. It's the state before action. When we are in touch with an essential quality, that is our source of resilience, vitality, and creativity. Why? Because it is unconditional. It's self-generating. It's self perpetuating. Um, what that means is it's permanent, it's timeless, it cannot be destroyed. Therefore, it's a constant fountain of life for us. It's a life force. That's what enables us to feel resilient and that we are in, it, it, it invigorates our vitality, it gives us a, a limitless source of creativity. It's the essence that does it, okay? So, um, when we say, oh, I'm creative, resourceful, and whole, it's not enough to just say that. When we are in a direct experience with our essence, meaning an essential quality, then suddenly we realize, I totally am whole. I totally am creative. I, I have access to all kinds of resources. That's a direct experience. So the, the why would we want to get in touch with an essential quality? It's because it's a felt and known experience that I have resources, that I am resourceful. It's not an idea. That's why it's important to get in touch with an essential quality. When we arrive at an essential quality, there is a, it's a state of calm. It could show up as peace, but it's such a calm where I feel like I could stay here forever. There's nowhere to go, there's nothing to do, nothing to be. That's a pure state of essence. That's the symptom or the sign that we are in something unconditional, permanent, and timeless. Uh, how is that for you guys? Does, does that seem well-defined? And it's very possible to experience this. You don't need 20 years of meditation. <laughs> this, with, with, following from the part one of the webinar, those simple questions to dial back active energy into essence, we can get here quite quickly. And it's through fascination and enjoyment that we will get here. Okay. So let's look at, um, uh, right, so energy, energy, any energy can be distilled back to its pure essence. Energy is an expression of essence, let's say, okay? Our behaviors are an expression of energy, which is an expression of the pure essence. So let's map out the 10 essential qualities. Now, before I mentioned, um, you have four main ones. The, the first two that will generally show up that are quite obvious, especially when you get somebody in an excited state, it's gonna be limitless creativity. Or if you're doing some peeling work or getting them in a far more receptive state, it might be peace. These are the two basic entry points into essential qualities. Limitless creativity might look like, oh my God, everything is possible. Oh my God, I can do anything. Oh my God, I'm so inspired. I could do this, that, and the other. Th that means they're in touch with something limitless and it's creative. Or peace, it just means, wow, I feel an incredible stillness right now. Or I feel very calm. I'm in a state of peace and calm or just a general good feeling of well-being. Okay, they're in that timelessness place, okay? And that, that can be a general sense of peace. From there, the other variations that might show up is, well, I feel connected to everything, all right? I feel a unity, or I just feel so blessed, or I feel gratitude, or I feel love, or I feel loved, or I feel appreciate, uh, appreciated, or I appreciate everything. 
these are your four main qualities. Limitlessness, unity, love, peace. And in my 15 years of experience, like I said, your main entry points are going to be either the limitlessness or peace. And then unity or love may show up. And keep in mind, people don't lock in to one or the other. They might migrate. Okay, and they might be experiencing one, then another, and another, and another. They might blend together, all right? So it's not, there's no hard and fast rules here. And this is why I sat on this for a long time, not releasing the 10 qualities, because I had a hunch that there's 10. I have a hunch maybe there's even 12, but right now I'm going with the 10. Um, and they they tend to blend it's almost like you've got uh some primary colors and then certain combinations of colors and you end up with a spectrum of 10 qualities okay so any questions there so far or um are we pretty good all right now um let's look at limitless creativity what are the variations that can happen you can Again, this is about limitlessness. So they may experience limitless creativity or they might lim uh, experience limitless potential or limitless wisdom, meaning I can see the potential in everything or I feel like I have access to all the wisdom of the world or like I have access to all this knowledge or I can get the knowledge. Like there's nothing stopping me from knowing everything. So other words for this, for limitless potential can be omnipotence. That can mean all powerful, but in actually, actual fact, it's mean, it means accessing the all potential, okay? Limitless wisdom could be omniscience, all knowing, all right? These are very divine qualities, okay? And they will border on to the, or they do go into spiritual territory. And I've had clients that claim to be agnostic or atheist. And when I get them dialed back into the essence and experiencing essential qualities, they'll say, oh my God, this, is this what a divine experience feels like? Because I've never felt this before. Um, you know, if they're experiencing unity, like is this what it's like to be in communion with God or the universe? It's like, wow. And I say, well, is that shocking to you? They go, no, this feels completely natural. So um, you don't need 20 years of meditation to experience this stuff. This can be done in, within a few minutes. And we've done uh, brainwave tests and the whole brainwave changes. So they use the whole brain and they drop into deep delta. So um, let's look at unity. Now unity means at one or oneness. But it can also be, I am everything, omnipresence. This is all being. I'm the tree, I'm the car, I'm the building, I'm the person across the street, I am you, okay? So I'm all being. Or I feel everything. I feel the tree across the street. I feel the lamppost. I feel you. I, I'm so interconnected with everything. That's omnisentience. Okay, so it can be I'm at one, I am everything, or I feel everything, okay? Now, when we look at the love, variations of love, um, two variations that show up is invulnerable vulnerability. This means I cannot be harmed. I feel invincible. And therefore I can be totally open. It's a paradox of I'm so open and transparent. Everything just flows right through me. Nothing can harm me. So I'm invulnerable to everything. And therefore I'm totally open and vulnerable to everything. Vulnerability meaning open. Invulnerable meaning cannot be harmed. Bliss, on the other hand, will, will be like there's an innate benevolence to everything around me, or there's a sense of perfection. What this, this, this is a, like there's a faith, a faith uh, that, that, that everything 
is as it is. It's perfectly arranged, highly designed, but it's, it's really about everything grows and creates. There's a life force in everything. And that gives me joy, a joy or a bliss that everything is so perfect or that everything grows or there's an, a, a, an energy and a life in everything. Does that make sense? Uh, the, what we mean by bliss. So imagine that if I'm feeling bliss, like there's an innate benevolence in everything. I have an undying faith that everything at its core is actually benevolent and it has a life force in it. And then I also feel like I can't be harmed and I'm totally open. So when I'm experiencing bliss and invulnerable vulnerability, then naturally I'm going to experience unconditional love. So when we look at these variations, we'll have a right-hand pillar, which is more active. Invulnerable vulnerability means I open myself out. Omnipresence, I'm everything. I'm putting myself out there to be everything. Or limitless potential, I sense out there, there is potential in everything. That is like an active force, okay? On the left side, we have more receptive qualities, like limitless wisdom, receiving the all-knowing, or I can access all wisdom or all-knowing. Omnisentience, I can feel everything around me. That's, that's a receptive quality. Or with bliss, I feel joy because everything has a natural life force and benevolence it's, uh, to it. That's, again, a receptive quality. And then in the center, it's the balancing factor. It's taking the active and the receptive, and it is, it is, at, uh, it is balanced or joined, okay? When I can be everything and I feel everything, then I'm at one with everything. When I'm open and indestructible, feeling bliss, joy, faith, undying faith that everything is innately benevolent, I can feel love. When I understand that there is limitless potential in everything and I have acts and I know everything, then I can be limitlessly creative. Okay. Does that make sense there? How the, these triangles work. So uh, does anybody recognize what that diagram is? Have you seen that diagram before? Uh, yes, I recognize yeah. in the Kabbalah. The Kabbalah, the tree of life. Yes. Yeah. So now I've mapped this was, well, in a way I had the intuition that this should be able to map on the tree of life. And when I was working through the natural progressions of these essential qualities, I actually conceived of it upside down, starting with peace and then to love and working my way through. And then I thought, well, what happens when I turn it upright? Because this then works with how it maps on our body. Now, for those of you who have studied Kabbalah, who know it way more intimately, um, I am not necessarily going to claim that there is a direct correlation with each sephira, although it's pretty close. But if you see discrepancies and you know the Kabbalah way more than I do, let me know. Because this isn't still written in stone, but I feel that this does map on quite naturally onto all the sephira, okay? And by knowing each of the sephira, um, it helps us understand the essential qualities as well. But like I said, essential qualities blend all together. So we may migrate usually between four or five different qualities, okay? So it's, I was so hesitant to categorize these, but I thought we could do it. So if we look at these triangles, the upper triangle is like divine awareness, that limitlessness. And then the middle triangle is relationship, unity, omnipresence, or omnisentience. And then we have divine experience, love, invulnerability, or bliss. You might think, well, why isn't love as divine relationship? Well, because when we're at one, that's a form of relationship. Love is the experience, okay? That's the sacred experience. And there's another way to look at these uh, as far as levels of our self or embodied self. So peace will be our embodied self. That's our earthly existence. And that's what 
we desire most on earth is peace, peace on earth. Then when we combine our embodied self with divine experience, that makes our higher self, our ability to experience unconditional love, unconditional bliss, and unconditional invulnerable vulnerability. Now, we also have higher levels of consciousness, which is sacred being. I'm not calling that sacred self because when, you're, when there's unity, there is no self. We're at one. Now I'm crossing into esoteric territory here, okay? So I would say sacred being and essential being are beyond the body. This is beyond ego. Well, even higher self is beyond ego because it's moving into unconditional territory, okay? This is just for your interest's sake, okay? But I'm hoping that this sparks deeper meditation or reflection when you can look at this diagram and feel free to take a screenshot of it. Um, so our sacred being is our, our way of being in divine relationship with it, with everything. And then our essential being is, let's say, our highest self of just pure awareness, potential, creativity, limitlessness. After that, it is pure source, okay? There is no self. There is no nothing awareness. It is just pure source, okay? So um, I, just for interest, I've divided these into essential being, sacred being, higher self, and embodied self. So why am I saying sacred being, essential being? Because in our physical bodies, it's impossible to experience true unity because we have the separation of the skin, okay? The bo physical bodies, right? But lovemaking is our closest expression to the unity that we can get to, okay? Um, and because of our physical bodies, to experience all potential, all wisdom, all creativity, that means you're everywhere at once, same with omnipresence, um, can't do it in the physical body. This is beyond ego and beyond body. These are out-of-body experiences, all right? So, but we can access it. We can get a taste of it. We can experience all 10. And um, we could even create meditations on, on each of these or create a, a vertical loop, a circulation loop with any of these qualities. And that's great work to do, to get to know what is it to be in a state of omnisentience. I can feel everything. What's it like to be in a state of limitless potential? I'm seeing the potential in everything. Um, these are ways to, to move beyond ego. And if you're thinking of what's coming from pure source, pure essence, and this follows the Kabbalah, is there's a, it's a pure state of creativity and then to potential and then wisdom, and then we get into all being and then all feeling, and that creates unity. And then this is pure strength. Invulnerable vulnerability can also be known as strength, unconditional strength because I can't be harmed and I'm completely open. That brings bliss and then love and peace. And the peace is the culmination of all these qualities together. So in a way you can think of the white light of essence, that's peace. I know I've got it green there, but think of it as white. And then you've got the nine variations of that, the nine emanations, okay? And when they all combine, it creates embodied peace. What are your comments or questions here on seeing this all mapped out? Where does it, is it useful or what's useful about it or what's inspiring or? It's all inspiring and I'm In feeling ways. this incredible peace. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I know I'm talking fast, but yes. <laughs> And yeah. Uh, and well, you're talking fast is uh, is not affecting your limitless being. Okay. Great. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all of these are highly receptive and they're highly kinetic at the same time. It's like just being in pure vibration and frequency. Then from there, you can choose to, to bring your, your, yourself back to it, meaning clothe it in the ego and the desires and all of that, and then take action. But you haven't lost the connection to the source. These are pure source qualities, okay? 
That's what I want to be very clear about. These are source qualities. They are not active yet, but they feed the actions. Yeah. Nero, did you want to add anything or did you have questions, comments? Yeah, this, it, it's a lot. I'm still kind of trying to take it in. Uh, but I had like one of the things that was coming up for me um, and, you know, in terms of what I see as source energy and I'm trying to see where does it fit over here is, you know, this deep, energy this deep kind of energy of everything's going to be okay so whether that's the resilience or i don't know what it is so where bliss. does that fit okay that's bliss bliss okay. because it's an undying faith that there's a natural order and benevolence to everything yes okay perfection does that make sense yes yes yeah so uh, um yeah there's many names for bliss it's a, the effect of it is bliss, but it, it's it's also grounded in undying faith, permanent like a faith, not a belief, but this knowing. Yes. It's just truth, faith, yeah. truth. That can be bliss and devotion. So all of those are encapsulated into that. Okay. Yeah. If you've studied the enneagram, yeah. uh, this maps well onto the enneagram. All right. Yes. Um, I know I've got 10 here, but they map onto um, the, the, the nine types, okay? Yes. The one that it does not map to is peace. That's the 10th quality because all types seek peace, okay? Mm. But the type nine, the mediator, matches with seeking love. It's the furthest quality away from them, okay? They could experience other qualities, like you'd think the mediator is seeking peace, but really it's not able to experience unconditional love because if it could experience unconditional love, it would not need to seek peace. It would not need to seek balance and harmony because the mediator is trying to balance disruption. It doesn't want to rock the boat, okay? Um, the type six, the loyal skeptic. I don't know if you guys know Enneagram that well, but yeah. the loyal skeptic. I'm, I'm a two. You're a two. Okay, yes. so it's so seeking, it um, unity. And uh, for, uh, oh, no, sorry. Uh, sorry, the type six is li seeking limitless creativity. Type three is seeking unity, omnipresence that the two seeks, the helper giver. Yes, the helper. Yeah, bliss is the perfectionist. It's the one thing that the, the perfectionist cannot experience because they're in such holding high standards and judgment. Yeah. They will not allow themselves to experience bliss until everything is perfect, right? And yeah. that's why there's always this underlying yeah. resentment in the perfectionist. And I think two is love. That's, that's what I think because when my understanding of two is that, yeah. you know, that's, the, that's what the giver is always looking for. That's what they're looking, they're using, they're trying to win love, okay? Yes. But you have to go a layer underneath that. What enables them to then experience unconditional love and it's when they can be everything or at one with everything, okay? The performer, it's about unity, mm -hmm. okay? It's just like with the, the, the mediator, you think that what they seek is peace. No, that's what they're striving for. When mm. they experience unconditional love, they are at peace, meaning then they're accepting anger. See, the mediator cannot accept anger. The, what the helper is actually seeking for is to, to get off the, the polarity of dependency. They want to create dependency, but then when it gets too much, they want that recognition. They're not getting that recognition. They want independence. And they're on this swing between independence and dependence. And they're using need in order to uh, win love, which then gives them a sense of validation within themselves. Yeah, it's all being for the two. When I can be everyone, everything, why do I need recognition from anyone? Do you understand? Why do I need their validation or approval when I am everyone, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. For the performer, why do I need to be obsessed with image and accomplishments and competition in order to gain recognition and gain love and approval from everyone 
When I'm at one with everyone, there's no such thing as competition. When I am the romantic, which is type four, okay, um, I need to feel special. I cling to pain in order to be unique and be, uh, you know, so, you know, special and, 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 and unique and authentic. And uh, I cling to the dramas, like recognize me, recognize me. I'm, I'm winning love through being, through the specialness. When I can feel everyone in everything, there's no need for drama. There's no need for being special because I feel into everything. We're so interconnected. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah. I had confusion. You can still see I have confusion because it <laughs> seems so counterintuitive how yeah. these map on, okay? Yeah. For example, when we look at type seven, the epicure, okay? This is where I'm avoiding all negativity and I want all these different experiences, honeymoon experiences, and the first challenge I meet, I. I say, no, I'll, I'll start a new project. I'll start a new project. It's like, I want to taste everything on the buffet table. Well, the Epicure is being driven by a mental process, not an experiential process. So they want to experience everything. They want to know everything. Well, when they settle into the essential quality of limits, limitless wisdom, there's no need to avoid negativity because they know all about it. There's no need to taste everything at the table because they know everything already. Now they can focus on experience. Instead of being driven so mentally, they can then counterbalance into experiencing the joys of life fully, including the negativity and the challenges, okay? The protector, number eight, the essential quality that they seek the most is invulnerable vulnerability. This is where I'm completely invincible, but I can be completely open. And so when they're experiencing invulnerable vulnerability, there's no such thing as weakness. Therefore, there's nothing to protect. Okay. When they feel that within themselves, when they can endow that within others, they're not so triggered to act upon their anger and, and bully situations around in order to protect the weak, to remain strong. So you've done some studies on the Enneagram, Niru? Uh, I'm just exploring it for myself. <laughs> so I, I know yeah. that I'm a two yeah. um, and I'm kind of trying to understand it, but I've not applied it with any of my clients. I'm just uh, very early stages of exploring the Enneagram, but I think it's, um, yeah. It's it's amazing. It's it's a really really cool tool, and I like that it's you've kind of mapped it over here uh, with that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And this we learn in module two, where we're doing direct correlations with how do you use the enneagram to find okay. out their patterns and behaviors, because it does map into the nine archetypes of the enneagram. It yeah. does not mean that we're stuck in one type. We actually use all nine, but we have preferences for maybe four or five types and we do gravitate or centralize on one main type during phases of our life, okay? Yeah. And also when we're alone, we gravitate towards one type. When we're in relationship, one-on-one -on -one with people, we may borrow from another type. And then when we are in groups, we may borrow from a type. But if we look through our entire life, there was one central type we were using, and it's mainly because that's our one life's mission is to embrace a lost essential quality, okay? So when I'm mapping a type to an essential quality, it is, I'm mapping the quality they seek the most, meaning it's the quality most disowned that they will reclaim and restore. And when I'm working with clients and I drop them into essential states of being, like I said, they'll migrate between four or five, but once in a while, they may migrate to almost all or all of them. And I had one client, you know, one time we were doing a session and she was acting very much like a protector and a, a mediator and she, but she was able to migrate to everything. And the very last one she landed on was love. And it was because the mediator tendencies were the strongest in her during the, the session. And I thought, wow, that is so 
logical and fitting that the very last quality she would land in is love. And it took quite a while to, to peel all those defenses away. But she very easily migrated from one to another to another, you know, and then it took, a, uh, but, but she naturally landed in there. Okay, and it was once she had a bit of a release of something that finally she was having, and she said she's never, in that session, she said, I've never experienced the nature of love in this way. It's so pure and it's so unconditional. It's so different than what I ever thought it was. So it was a, a real kind of embracing the shadow session where then she could really have the direct experience of one of those qualities. So it was quite amazing. Yeah. So um, I know I've gone on for quite a while, but what, what, um, what are you taking away from, from this now? What do you learn or what are you inspired with? Just as some final words and then we'll um, close up this part two. Yeah. Well, Troy, I don't know about um, precisely how to define this, but it's a, a sincere heartfelt compliment for you because you catalyze a lot of realization that I was working into the last few months. And I'm in the very moment, I'm feeling all these bliss and qualities within myself. And I want to thank you. Yes. For that. Thank you. Yeah, well, I'm, I mean, this is years of work and research and it's presented and then you can take this and run with it and yeah, and just keep enjoying all the, the, as you taste each quality. Yeah. Yeah. Let it be a foundation. Yes, and I have this you incredible know, sense of great uh, grace and gratitude for you. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'm very happy. Um, yeah. Thank you so much uh, for sharing this. Um, I, I'm quite overwhelmed with all of this information. Um, so I think for me, um, I'm really curious. And I think also uh, I'm a, I have a bit of excitement to really understand this a little bit more. Um, I feel like there's so much more. If I look at the last couple of months in terms of where I've been going in terms of trying to explore my own spirituality and my own journey, uh, but also kind of where I'm seeing uh, my coaching is going with my clients. Um, I do see this as, uh, you know, really interesting tool. I think it's giving me some structure, um, you know, to kind of uh, comprehend, <laughs> I guess, what it is. You know, and uh, as you said, uh, it's, you know, it's powerful. You could spend, you know, decades trying to learn meditation and then you could close your eyes and, you know, um, in a flash, you could be at this place of uh, innate creativity or limitless creativity. And I think that it's just uh, kind of a resource for me that I'm, um, I'm learning that, you know, it's, it's maybe, um, you know, one, one of the things that I've been picking up over the last couple of years is, you know, take the path of least resistance, you know, so it's not the climb up the mountain, like the hard way that everyone else is like saying you have to do, but this is kind of, um, I don't want to call it a shortcut, but it's the path of least resistance. It's the path of, you know, just following where the essence is. So, uh, so, so that's, exactly. that's really interesting, but thank you so much. I can see how much of uh, work has gone into this. Um, and I love that mm -hmm. you're, uh, you know, mapping it with some of these more ancient uh, structures as well. Um, and, you know, that really gives me a lot of yeah. confidence in terms of the validity and uh, of, of this model. So, so thank you so much. And it, it, um, you're welcome. Yeah, it, it works. Um, this was researched more from experience, trial and error, and then seeing what does this match with? And yes. as opposed to trying to force uh, something on the map. Yeah. Um, and it nat the 10 essential qualities naturally fit with the Enneagram, naturally fit with the Kabbalah and, and, yeah. and beyond. And really, it's more about when you're listening to someone's response as they hit an essential level or yourself, it gives you a little more clarity of what they could possibly be experiencing. 
If they say, wow, I feel connected to everything. Well, then they're in divine relationship. It's, it's either unity, all being, or all feeling. Right. And then you can help clear, help them clarify like, Oh, when you see, say you feel connected with everything, does that mean you're at one? There's a total oneness or you are everything or you feel everything, feel interconnected. Then they can specify it. It's not to define it. It's to specify. Hmm. Same with, Oh, I, I, I feel so like full of joy and full of love and so open. Well, they're describing all three of divine experience. Mm -hmm. So then where is it? And they might move through all three, you know, but it's where do they settle? Because it might be in the bliss state or it might be in the unconditional love state or it might be in in vulnerable vulnerability, which is that's that's your essential quality that brings strength, trust and courage. Okay, that quality is the source of trust and courage, for example, and strength. So it just helps you hear things. Yes. Um, more precisely. Yes. If anything, use that map in that way. Don't pay attention to, well, which paths. It will migrate anywhere. Mm-hmm. Don't, that's why I never included the 22 paths of the Kabbalah here. It's mm-hmm. more of, you've got a central column and then variations on the right and the left that are either active or receptive. All right, and that's it. That's all you need. And if anything, just remember the four main ones. Limitlessness, unity, love, and peace. That's really all you need. Yeah. So um, if anyone has um, more questions, again, just to contact me, visit our website, essence-dynamics.com or email me, troy at essence-dynamics.com. Um, and um, I'm always happy to hear from you with your questions or your comments, insights, and discoveries. And um, all of this stuff gets taught way in detail with practical tools and practice um, in our modules. And like I said, we're gonna have an online version in April, April 24th to 26th. And then if that works, then maybe we'll do something in May or during the summer as well. So thank you both. And thank thank you you everyone for listening to the recording and um, look forward to seeing you all again next week.